Hi everyone, welcome to lesson number 28. Today we're going to be talking about the reforms of King Hezekiah and King Josiah, two of the, the good kings of the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, let's read the introduction at the top of page 102. Though all the kings of Israel and most of the kings of Judah were wicked men who disobeyed the Lord, there were still some godly kings in the southern kingdom, Judah. King Hezekiah and King Josiah both worked to restore worship of the true God at times when most of the people had fallen away. Uh, looking at the timeline, uh, King Hezekiah's reforms uh, took place around 715 uh, BC. King Josiah's reforms around 633 BC, so almost a hundred years, almost a century uh, between these two uh, good kings. Uh, but they were th they were both uh, good kings. Some of the the very few good kings that that reigned in Jerusalem over the kingdom of Judah. We're going to be reading uh, Second Chronicles chapter 29, verses 1 through 36 chapter 30 verses 1 through 27 and then chapter 31 verse 1 uh, and here we read about Hezekiah's temple work and Passover. Uh, so we'll see that King Hezekiah did what was right in God's sight and because of Hezekiah's reforms the people of Judah once again celebrated the Passover as God had instructed. So please pause the video and read those chapters and verses. Okay, let's look at the questions then. Question number one, what do we learn about Hezekiah right away in uh, chapter 29 verse 2, which shows that he was different than almost every other king that Israel or Judah ever had? What was different about Hezekiah that set him apart from uh, from the other kings? Uh, well, he uh, he actually did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Almost every other king uh, in both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, um, almost every other king was wicked. But here Hezekiah, uh, he actually did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He was a good king. Number two, what had King Ahaz, Hezekiah's father, done? Uh, that made it necessary to restore the temple. Uh, read Second Chronicles chapter 28, verses 19 through 25 for some background. What did Hezekiah's father do as king? What had uh, Hezekiah's father, King Ahaz, done? Um, why was it necessary for Hezekiah to do all of this work to restore the temple? Uh, well, King Ahaz, he, he closed the temple. Uh, he shut it down. Uh, he got rid of, discarded, threw away, sold off some of the, the treasures of the temple, uh, the utensils um, made of, of precious metals that were used there at the temple. Uh, he got rid of those. Uh, he set up altars uh, in the, the temple, in the temple courts throughout Jerusalem, throughout Judah, uh, to false gods. Um, and so King Ahaz was one of many bad kings. Uh, Hezekiah, though, somewhere along the way, um, heard the truth, uh, knew the true God, and knew what he, he had to do. Number three, what did Hezekiah direct the Levites to do according to uh, chapter 29, verses 4 and 5?
what did uh, Hezekiah direct the, the Levites to do? Uh, he told them to get themselves ready um, and to get the temple ready for God's service. And this, this took a while uh, to do. Uh, and maybe this is something that we understand a little bit better than, than we did even just uh, months or years ago. Uh, essentially, what the Levites had to do, and, and the priests uh, as well, uh, what they had to do to purify themselves or, or cleanse themselves or make sure that they were ceremonially clean uh, was essentially go into uh, quarantine. Uh, they had to quarantine themselves from from anything that would make them unclean. And uh, Israelite law, uh, the law given through Moses, um, had, had a list of things that you weren't allowed to touch or deal with, um, uh, things that would make you unclean, things like dead bodies and, and so on. Um, and so they would basically have to quarantine themselves for a while uh, to make sure that they were ceremonially clean. Um, and then when they were ceremonially clean, they could go into the temple courts and the temple uh, to purify and clean the temple. Number four, how long did this cleaning and restoration work take? How long did uh, this work take? It took 16 days, which maybe doesn't sound like a huge amount of time, uh, but but think about it this way. It says there in Second Chronicles, it took eight days just to get to uh, the entrance to the temple itself, to get from uh, the entrance to the temple courts to the entrance to uh, the temple building. Um, you could think of it almost as kind of the, the narthex, uh, we call it today, the entryway. Um, there were so many idols and so much other junk and filth and, and who knows what um, between the, the front door of the church um, and the, the entranceway into the, the church sanctuary itself. Uh, that it took eight days just to get rid of it all. Eight days just to clean the, the narthex, the gathering area uh, of junk. And then another eight days to, to cleanse the, the sanctuary, the temple building itself. So when you think about it that way, that's, uh, that's pretty extreme. It's not just that there was one idol or two idols or just a few idols kind of scattered around. Um, the, the temple and the temple courts were filled with, with idols, false gods, and, and all sorts of, uh, of junk. Number five, once the temple was ready, what was the first thing that they did there at the temple? The first thing they did after uh, the temple was prepared, uh, they offered sacrifices of uh, thanksgiving and praise uh, to God. Also, sacrifices uh, for their sins and the sins of the people in allowing the temple to get so bad. Um, but they offered sacrifices uh, to God. We see here they have their priorities straight. Number six, according to 29 verses 32 to 34, what problem did they run into as the temple worship was being restored? So what problem did they run into? And, and this is a good problem uh, to have. Uh, there weren't enough priests uh, available to handle all of the offerings uh, coming in. 
uh, there were so many people coming to uh, this newly uh, rededicated temple with so many offerings to the Lord uh, that they, they just couldn't handle uh, all of the work in um, accepting and preparing uh, these sacrifices, these offerings. Uh, so this is a, a good problem, uh, that there are lots of people there in Jerusalem, in the kingdom of Judah, uh, who are ready and willing to offer their sacrifices to the one true God as well. Number seven, after this, Hezekiah worked to restore the celebration of the Passover meal. What was the Passover about? Review lesson 13. What was the, the Passover uh, all about? Uh, well, this was the special meal, the special celebration of how God saved uh, his people all the way back in, in Egypt. Uh, we are now, uh, what, uh, 800, 700 years after uh, the exodus from Egypt, uh, but, but this is a, a celebration that they were uh, supposed to celebrate every year. Of course, uh, it had fallen to the wayside as, as people uh, went after false gods, uh, but this was the celebration of God saving his people from slavery and death uh, in Egypt, how the angel of death passed over uh, the homes of, of uh, the Israelites who had put the blood of the lamb on their doorposts uh, I'm sure you remember that from Lesson 13. Uh, so this was a celebration of God saving his people. Number eight, as he restored the celebration of the Passover, Hezekiah didn't call only the people of the southern kingdom of Judah to worship. Whom else did he call? See 30 verse 6. Whom else did uh, Hezekiah invite to come and celebrate the Passover? Uh, he sent messengers and invited people from the northern kingdom as well. Uh, now, by this time, uh, the northern kingdom had been destroyed by the Assyrian Empire. That's what we talked about last time. Uh, and so technically, there was no such thing as the northern kingdom anymore. But there were uh, people, Israelites, uh, still living. Uh, in that, that region, um, even as foreigners were being brought in, again, like we talked about last time. Uh, so he sent messengers to invite uh, sort of these, these remnants of, of people left uh, up in the, the remains of the northern kingdom to come and, and celebrate the Passover uh, as well. Maybe this is the time for, uh, for all of God's people to be reunited, to come together again, uh, celebrating the Passover in Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord. It would have been a, a wonderful thing. Uh, number nine, how long had it been since the Passover was celebrated properly like this, according to chapter 30, verse 26? How long had it been uh, since uh, the Passover uh, was celebrated uh, properly? Um, it had been uh, almost 300 years, not since the days of Solomon uh, was uh, the Passover celebrated um, properly, correctly, according to the instructions that, that God had given to them through Moses. That's a long time to go 
uh, without celebrating uh, the Passover, or at least not celebrating it uh, the way they were supposed to be uh, celebrating it. Number 10, after the Passover celebration was over, what did the people of Judah do at home and abroad, according to uh, chapter 31, verse 1? What did the, the people of Judah uh, do after this Passover celebration? Uh, they uh, went throughout Jerusalem, throughout the kingdom of Judah, uh, destroying idols, destroying uh, shrines, uh, high places they're called, uh, set up uh, to these, these false gods. And they didn't do it just in the kingdom of Judah. They even traveled up to the former kingdom of Israel and tore down uh, the idols and the shrines uh, up there as well. So really, they cleanse the entire, uh, the entire promised land of false gods and idols and, and shrines. All right, so good King Hezekiah. Now we go to another good king, uh, King Josiah. Second uh, Kings 22, 1 through 20, and then 23, 1 through 27. Uh, only two kings later, much of what Hezekiah had done was lost and forgotten. Uh, king Josiah was the, the grandson of King Hezekiah, and so it didn't take very long. It really took just one bad king in between them to ruin everything. Um, so much of what Hezekiah had done was, was lost and forgotten. So Josiah worked to once again raise the prominence of God's word among the people. So please pause the video, read 2 Kings 22, 1 through 20, and 23, 1 through 27. Okay, questions. Question 11. Uh, read 2 Kings 21, 2 through 7, and 16. What did Hezekiah's son Manasseh do? when he was king in Judah. What did uh, Manasseh do to ruin uh, everything that Hezekiah had done? Um, well, uh, if Hezekiah was um, an especially good king, uh, his son Manasseh was an especially wicked and evil king. Uh, he rebuilt all of the places of false worship that Hezekiah had destroyed. Uh, he filled the temple and the temple courts with idols uh, once again. Uh, he killed innocent people, including some of his own children, uh, very sadly, um, and this is a, just a, a disgusting thing, um, child sacrifice was uh, a common way of worshiping some of these, these Canaanite uh, gods, these, these false gods of the, the peoples around them, um, and Manasseh uh, fell into that too. He worshiped these false gods by, by sacrificing his own children. Uh, to them. Uh, so just a, a terribly evil and, and wicked king, Manasseh. Although at the very end of his life, he did uh, repent of his evil and was forgiven by God. Uh, number 12, what did Josiah begin to do in the 18th year of his reign? Uh, see chapter 22, verses 3 through 7.
what did Josiah uh, begin to do? Uh, he began uh, extensive repair work on the temple. So uh, not just uh, cleaning it out again, but it appears, it, it sounds like there were some uh, structural issues even with the temple. It was beginning to uh, fall apart. Uh, that's how neglected it had been for, for hundreds of years. And so Josiah begins a project to clean it out and then also to repair it. Number 13, as uh, they were doing their work, what long lost item did the workers find? So what, uh, what did they find as they were um, cleaning out and repairing the temple? They found the book of the law. The book of the law, the law is the scrolls upon which uh, the first five books of the Bible were written. Uh, the books of uh, Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, we call them uh, today. So uh, essentially, they found the Bible. Uh, so just think about that. Uh, think about how far... Uh, the people would have to fall away from God to uh, forget where uh, the Bible was, to forget what the Bible uh, was. They come across this scroll and, oh, what's this? And, and they open it up and, and start reading it and uh, realize, oh, this is, this is the book of the law. This is uh, the Bible. Uh, that's a pretty sad commentary on how far uh, they had fallen away from God that they, they totally forgot about, about the Bible. Number 14, uh, why do you think Josiah tore his robes when he heard the book of the law read? Note 22, verse 13. Why did uh, Josiah tear uh, his robes? This is not something that we're familiar with really uh, today, but um, in that culture at that time, tearing your robes was a, a symbol of uh, deep distress and sorrow and mourning. Uh, they, they begin to uh, read the Bible to Josiah, basically, and he realizes what this book is, or what this scroll is. They didn't have books back then. What, what this scroll is, um, he realizes all of the things that God had done uh, for the people, uh, all of the ways that they had, had fallen away from God uh, in the, the centuries that followed. Um, and so he is in deep distress and sorrow and mourning over, um, over everything that they had lost, everything that they had, had um, fallen away from and left behind. Number 15, what did God say was coming to the southern kingdom of Judah because of their faithlessness? So we might expect uh, that this story is going to have a, a happy ending. King Josiah fixed everything and God uh, was, was happy uh, and the people lived happily ever after. Uh, but this story really has more of a, a bittersweet uh, sort of ending because uh, God tells Josiah uh, that he is still going to bring disaster to Judah. Uh, the kingdom of Judah is also going to fall. Jerusalem is going to be uh, destroyed. It's, uh, it's too late for the kingdom of Judah. The decision has been made. 
Um, and so while Josiah's reforms are good and God pleasing, this is a Josiah is a good king and he does um, does good things uh, for uh, Judah. Uh, it's too little, too late if you want to think about it that way. Uh, disaster is is still coming. Number sixteen, though disaster was coming, what did God promise King Josiah? What promise did God make to good King Josiah? Uh, God told him this disaster is coming and it is going to be terrible, but Josiah, um, I will spare you from having to live through that. I will spare you from having to see uh, the destruction of uh, your kingdom. Um, I'll wait till after you are, uh, are gone before this disaster comes. Number 17, King Josiah wasn't the only one moved by God's word. Who else pledged themselves to God's law? Who else pledged themselves to God's law? All of the people of Judah pledged themselves to uh, to the one true God uh, and his word. Um, and, and again, this must have been kind of a bittersweet sort of, of scene. Um, Josiah knows, and we would assume the people uh, know as well, uh, that disaster and destruction are coming. Um, and yet, uh, they still... Uh, pledge themselves to the one true God, um, even though they know it's it's too late to change things. Um, you know, th it's not like they can uh, be good and they're going to make up for all of the evil that had been done before them and change God's mind. Um, but still, they decide with the days that we have left, we are going to serve and obey and glorify uh, the one true God. Number 18, what practical things did Josiah do to redirect people to the Lord? What sorts of things did Josiah do to uh, help people remain uh, loyal to the one true God? He got rid of uh, the altars and anything else that had been dedicated to uh, false gods. Uh, so Hezekiah got rid of all of these things and then Manasseh uh, put them right back. And now here Josiah gets rid of them uh, again. Number 19, what evidently was different about the Passover celebration during Josiah's reign compared with the celebration that Hezekiah had initiated? Compare 2 Kings 23, 22, and 23 with 2 Chronicles 30, 4 through 12. Uh, what's the difference between Hezekiah's celebration of the Passover and Josiah's celebration? So what was uh, different about uh, Josiah's celebration of the Passover? It was even bigger than Hezekiah's. Uh, we're told that uh, 
Hezekiah's celebration of the Passover uh, hadn't, you know, one, one that size hadn't been seen since the days of Solomon. Uh, but with Josiah, we're told that um, one like this hadn't been seen since the days of uh, the judges even longer uh, ago. And so uh, this was even, even bigger, uh, even more people there, a higher percentage of the people uh, were there uh, for Josiah's celebration of uh, the Passover. And that makes sense when you think back to what we read about with Hezekiah, that Hezekiah sent messengers out but many of the people uh, mocked and ridiculed these messengers. They declined the invitation. Uh, here it seems that, that more people accepted the invitation to, to come. So this was, was even bigger. Number 20. How do we know the sins Manasseh led the Israelites to commit must have been particularly repulsive to God? So we talked about some of the sins of Manasseh, um, and and here we see, like we talked about before, that there was really no going back. Uh, God had already decided, because of the terrible sins of Manasseh and and all of the the wicked kings before him, uh, that Jerusalem would be uh, destroyed. Um, and so this is a wonderful thing that Josiah does, uh, but in the the big scheme of things, it's not going to to change uh, the result. 21. How did both King Hezekiah's and King Josiah's reforms demonstrate a love for the third commandment? It's printed there for you on page 104. So the, the third commandment uh, tells us not to despise preaching and the word like some of those bad kings did, uh, but to regard it as uh, something that is holy, something that is special, something that is important uh, to gladly hear and learn God's word. Uh, so both of these good kings, uh, they showed that they loved God and his word more than anything else. That, that really is what made them good kings. 22. Uh, more than 2,000 years after Hezekiah and Josiah worked to restore devotion to God's word, Martin Luther uh, noted that the church in his day did not know what the Bible said either. He and many others worked hard to try to reform the church of his day. To address the problem of ignorance about God's word, Luther wrote his small catechism, which we've been uh, looking at uh, in parts here in, uh, in this um, workbook and we'll look at in more detail next year. Um, the small catechism is a short book that walked through the Ten Commandments, the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer, and so on. Uh, the catechism used questions and answers to teach people about God's word. You see an example of that up in the third commandment, right? Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, and then there's a question, what does this mean? And then the answer, here's what, here's what it means. Uh, why do you think that Luther put together this book called uh, The Catechism? Why did Luther uh, put together this book called the Catechism? Because he wanted everyone to learn God's word. Um, in the Old Testament, God's word was not something that was just for uh, the priests or the Levites. 
uh, today. Uh, God's Word is not just something for pastors or teachers. Uh, God's Word is meant for, for everyone, for, for all Christians, all believers. And the Catechism is a very useful uh, summary uh, of the, the basic teachings of God's Word so that, that everyone can, can learn them. And we'll talk a lot more about the Catechism next year. Uh, 23, uh, why is Luther's small catechism still useful for us today? So we, we touched on this already, uh, but Luther's small catechism, we use it today because, again, it teaches us the, the core, the, the basic truths of the Christian faith so that we can learn about God and what he's uh, done for us. Okay, key questions. A, how did kings Hezekiah and Josiah differ from most of the other kings in Judah and Israel? Uh, well, they actually believed in the one true God and they obeyed him, listened to his word. B, what did Hezekiah and Josiah do to lead the people in the right direction back to God? Uh, they restored the worship of the one true God, and they also eliminated the worship of uh, false gods, but um, they, they pointed people to God and his word. C, what was still going to be the fate of those living in the southern kingdom of Judah despite the reforms of these godly kings? Uh, Judah's unfaithfulness. Uh, despite these these um, bright spots that we've talked about today, uh, overall Judah was still unfaithful to God and his word, um, and destruction was coming, and we're going to start talking about that here in coming lessons. Okay, uh, homework. Uh, please work on memorizing the third commandment, which we talked about in this lesson. No Bible passages to look at this time. Uh, please uh, review the key questions for this lesson, and then there are some pages also to, uh, to read in the Catechism. Uh, thanks for watching um, and participating, uh, and uh, again, as always, uh, get in touch with me if, if you need anything or have any questions, but that'll do it for this lesson. Uh, God's blessings on your day.